Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another session of uh, SACPA. During this time of social and physical distancing, SACPA believes it's important to keep engaging with the public on issues of the day. And in order to do so, we are very thankful for the continued support we receive from the University of Lethbridge, Shaw Spotlight, and the Lethbridge Herald. Today, our speakers are Wayne King and Brad Hagen uh, on the topic of thank you for your service. How well are we reconnecting? Uh, how well are we recognizing and supporting Canadian Armed Force veterans as they re-enter society? Um, Brad Hagen is a registered psychologist with the College of Alberta for Psychologists since 2009 and has a master's in counseling along with a PhD. He has over 25 years of experience in teaching and conducting research at universities in Western Canada in the areas of mental health, nursing, addictions and psycho psychology. Currently, Brad is a professor emeritus at the University of Lethbridge. Wayne King joined the RCAF in 1959 after completing an education at the University of Alberta. He began training as a pilot. He has operational tour. His first operational tour was in Air Defense Command flying the C-101 aircraft at RCAF station Bagotville in Quebec. Following that, he was trained on the C-130 aircraft and became engaged in the worldwide logistical and tactical support. An exchange tour with the USAF followed on the C-141 aircraft, which involved worldwide strategic and tactical air support, including Vietnam. Wayne eventually assumed command of 429 Squadron in Winnipeg. He was later promoted to Colonel and post posted to National Defence College in Kingston, Ontario. He retired from the military in 1982. Um, before we start, both of you, I just want to apologize for um, the uh, Skype. Um, we're having some issues with Skype and bringing Wayne in, video in. So currently we just see Brad, but we have the sound of Wayne. So welcome both of you and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Annalise, for the warm welcome. Yes, indeed. So, uh, Wayne, we were chatting a few days ago, and uh, we, we thought you would uh, please just lead the charge with, with some of the issues you're seeing with veterans in terms of your important role at the Legion. So I wondered if you could please just start by briefly introducing your role at the Legion in terms of how you support veterans there and some of the issues you're seeing, and then I, I can pipe in as appropriate as well. Okay, uh, Brad, that's fine. I, I am uh, the... Uh, branch service officer, and it's my responsibility to contact the veterans in our community and uh, work with them to ensure that they receive the uh, benefits and assistance that they're entitled to from Veterans Affairs. The, uh, the job is very rewarding in many respects, but also it has its frustrations because one of the difficulties I face is in finding out and being able to contact who the veterans are in our community. Unfortunately, there's no single source I can go to to uh, find out who they are uh, and uh, get uh, contact information. With the current laws, uh, even those in residence at uh, full care facilities, they are not at liberty to tell me which of their residents are veterans and uh, any of them that might need assistance. So it becomes a, a degree of frustration in that respect. But nonetheless, uh, I, I suppose there's always the option of going around various parking lots and putting my card under, <laughs> under the windshield wipers uh, or advertising in the newspaper. But uh, right now I'm limited to media such as this and word of mouth to get the word out to the veterans. Yeah. No, it's it's funny you mentioned the cards in the waiting room or in the parking lot, Wayne, because I've actually had some veterans that tell me they'll follow another veteran if they see a veteran license plate, follow him or her right to the driveway and uh, just go and introduce themselves and see if they know about veteran services. So 
you're, you're right. It's crazy the, the lengths we have to go to to reach out to veterans. So if you are able to find a veteran, Wayne, can you please let them, uh, can you please just quickly chat about the kinds of services you try and connect veterans with and some of the challenges you see them having? Well, I work through the Legion Service Center in Calgary. Uh, that's the Alberta Command. And once the, the veteran gives authority to allow the service center access to his service record as well as his medical record. Uh, those are reviewed. I discuss with the veteran what problems he's having, what assistance he would like to see in place. And from that, then in consultation with the, the uh, service officers in Calgary uh, who are in direct liaison with the uh, veterans Affairs staff people in uh, well various locations around the around the country we determine what assistance might be available to them uh, what additional evaluation is required whether it involves specialists in the medical field or simply a review of their service file and uh, if uh, everything falls into place then various uh, assistance programs can be initiated Okay, and our, I mean, I know you deal with all kinds of different requests and, and veterans through your work in the Legion, Wayne, but would you say there's some more common issues that some of the veterans you, you work with are facing or some of the services you try and connect them with? Are there common scenarios? Yes, and, and some which are more difficult to come to grips with than others. Uh, a veteran who has a broken limb uh, is relatively easy to deal with in the concept of uh, getting medical attention to his disability. But uh, psychological effect of the service they've been involved in over the years. And those are difficult, uh, as you will certainly be able to attest, difficult to pin down and identify in any concrete way. But the real difficulty is in how do you treat those disabilities? Because yeah. the, the impact is not only on the veteran, but it's also on the, the veteran's family, their children, their spouse, and uh, those in their uh, social community. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Wayne, I can I can speak to that in just a few moments. But do, do you um, do you have some ideas as to why uh, maybe veterans don't approach you directly, but it's maybe a friend or family member or something that tries to connect with you? Well, the veteran typically, when he uh, either volunteers or is selected for overseas duty in a in a hostile environment, undergoes in company with his uh, teammates, his, the uh, members of his unit, uh, they undergo some very intensive training over a prolonged period of time. And they're not sent overseas until their instructors feel that they're properly prepared for the uh, dangers and the uh, environment that they're going to uh, enter into. Once there, of course, they, they very quickly realize just how difficult and how much at risk they are and uh, but yet they're in a very tightly knit community of uh, soldiers, sail sailors, airmen, and it's, it's a bond that develops, which uh, certainly is comparable to that in a, in a family, and one which the, the veteran or the uh, soldier, airman, sailor, very quickly becomes dependent upon. They know that their comrades have got their back, and they similarly have the back of everybody in their unit. But when they return back to Canada out of that environment, some of the, the uh, difficulties and, quite frankly, the horrors of uh, some of the uh, scenes that they were involved in uh, remain in their mind. But yet they're separated from that support structure that they've been able to have while they were in service. And they tend to isolate themselves. They isolate themselves from the community. They isolate themselves from their family. 
and the difficulties arise, which impact all of those social connections. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you, can I just speak to a few of those points, Wayne? Because I think you raised some important points, and they're things that I see with a lot of the veterans I work with. You certainly can, yes. Yeah. So as you pointed out, uh, Wayne, a lot of the veterans I talk to, they're you know, they're obviously a bit nervous or maybe apprehensive or a bit excited when they're going overseas on some kind of deployment or even doing some kind of uh, work in um, Canada. I was just reading about Romeo Dallaire when uh, he was involved in mm -hmm. the FLQ crisis and having to uh, deploy with, with troops in Ottawa. And so, but as you pointed out, they, re they receive excellent training and, and these men and women are actually excited to go over and do what they're trained for. And as you obviously pointed out, even though we ask these men and women to do very, very difficult roles under extremely difficult and dangerous circumstances. They're proud of what they do, and they're they're excellent at what they do, and they enjoy a, an international reputation for being um, in, incredibly skilled uh, members of the armed forces. But as you pointed out, they they have this this tight knit group that they can get support from, and uh, they have routine, and they have the resources they need. But when they come back, as you pointed out. That, that's when the veterans I work with really struggle because they no longer have, as one author calls it, their, their tribe. Um, these are people that they've gone through training with and through deployments with and countries like Afghanistan or Bosnia. And then they come back and everyone disperses um, and they don't have this tight knit group. And as you pointed out, many veterans actually say they feel closer to these people than their own family. They've for their entire deployment, they've been within six feet of each of these people and, and you eat with them and you sleep with them and you go to the bathroom right beside them and you, you take fire from them and, and uh, you're with this group. And when you come back, you, you don't have that support anymore. So um, I hear a lot of veterans just feel incredibly lonely and cut off. And as you pointed out, um, even though they've, they've done incredible work overseas, it's they've seen or done things that they can't talk to their own family about and they can't talk to people <laughs> who are civilians about. So, you know, I, I have quite a few veterans who were deployed in Bosnia and many many Canadians don't even know the important role that uh, the Canadians did in, in Bosnia, but there was, there was a horrific genocide there and many Canadian soldiers were involved in uh, investigating mass graves or going into hospitals or schools where there've been unspeakable atrocities. And even though they, they had support over there, when they come back here, there, there's no one to talk to about those. Um, and as you also pointed out, when they're overseas, they're doing their job, they're, they're absorbed with their daily duties, but when they come back, their, their nervous systems won't shut down. Um, and Wayne, the, one of the main things I've noticed with at least about half of my veterans is they cannot shut off their fear of snipers because when they were in places like Bosnia or even Afghanistan, snipers were a real threat. Um, and even when the Canadians were involved in investigating mass graves in Bosnia, they were often um, under threat of snipers while they were doing this work. So I have many veterans who can't even enjoy a holiday in Banff or Waterton or Jasper because they have to keep the curtains closed because they're afraid of snipers or they can't go out for a walk if there's high buildings around because they're checking the rooftops and balconies. And even though it doesn't make rational sense that there's snipers in Lethbridge, uh, their nervous system won't shut this off because these are life and death skills and their body's trying to keep them alive. But the veterans are, are in agony because they, they can't live a normal life. Their, their brains won't shut off. And I, I think one of the one of the aspects of this, uh, speaking from the veterans' point of view, when they do return, they, they realize very quickly that uh, they are uh, subject to some disabilities that arise out of their service, service to the country uh, while in this overseas theater. But when they do return and try and deal with it uh, to seek help and so on, the bureaucracy and the requirements of uh, getting the entitled support to them is an extremely lengthy process. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've got many, many uh, veterans who have been trying to get the support they need for themselves and, quite frankly, their families. Yeah. Uh, and the process has lasted well over a year, and there's been no resolution. I'm mm -hmm. not talking about the actual treatment of the 
of the disability. I'm talking about getting to the door, getting the door open yeah. so that they can receive that, uh, that uh, uh, support that they're so entitled to. And it's a very, very difficult thing. Uh, many of them, unfortunately, succumb to the feeling that nobody cares. I'm mm -hmm. not going to get the support. And yeah. they, they turn to drugs or alcohol, which, of course, does little more than worsen the, the problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, their, uh, in their reaction to their situation, they have really no other outlet. Exactly. Well, and the unfortunate thing with alcohol is it does calm down their nervous system quickly um, in the short term for at least half an hour, an hour. And when you're desperately trying to shut off your brain. Um, yeah, as, but as you pointed out, there, there's a sting in the tail and it makes things worse. Um, Wayne, I, I run into the same thing. Uh, when another veteran encourages one of the veterans I see to seek help or a family member encourages the, the veteran to seek help, um, the veteran may really be at wit's end and they may be, you know, so completely isolated. They're, they're living in a car. They're, they're not able to work. They're, they've completely isolated and cut themselves off. They can't connect with other veterans. So when they, when they do come for help, you're absolutely right. They're, they're sometimes close to the end of the rope and they want help. And then I have to try and explain to them or, or coach them through or try and uh, encourage them to wade through the bureaucracy. Um, so I may have someone who's ready, for example, to try and get some assistance because they're, they're, you know, even though only approximately 30% of veterans might have PTSD, um, the ones that do have it really struggle. And so they might be ready to receive some kind of support only to face this avalanche of paperwork that they have to wade through. And I'll do my best to try and help them with it. Um, but typically it's, it's the veterans that I'm just speaking about, uh, male veterans here, but, uh, it, well, female veterans as well. If, if they have a partner or a spouse of some kind that can help them do this paperwork, they'll often hang in there. But if it's just themselves, uh, they often just throw the paperwork away and give up. And, and like you said, they feel like, uh, I guess no one really wants me to get help. So they, they all mention their bureaucracy and the waiting six to 12 months for some kind of program to kick in is, is incredibly frustrating. It is, and it's very, in and of itself, it, uh, it worsens their situation immeasurably. Uh, I've got uh, some veterans whom I work with that uh, they basically abandon the family because they're afraid of the harm they're doing to them. And uh, they uh, go into total isolation. Yeah. And it uh, the veterans affairs don't really advertise what they what services are available, how they can mm -hmm. help, and so on. Yeah, it's difficult to find the way, and yeah. uh, that's that's one of the roles that we have uh, through the Legion. But of all the well in the Lethbridge area, I would estimate that we've probably got in excess of, uh, well, perhaps it well in excess of a thousand veterans in mm -hmm. our community. Yeah, I think and, that's about right, Wayne. And, and they range from World War II veterans up to the most recent uh, enrollee yeah. uh, who's been released from service. And yet, as members of the Legion, there are fewer than 300 who are on our rolls that I'm able to contact. So I know there's a whole community out there, yeah. some of whom are suffering PTSD and other disabilities uh, for which they're entitled support. But I don't know who they are, where they are. I don't have telephone numbers, names, or anything else. So it's a matter of trying to find them and get them in touch with myself and uh, the Legion support system. But uh, it's difficult. It's frustrating. Yeah. Well, and... One of the barriers I, I find I face, Wayne, is just the issue of trust, because as you pointed out, uh, you're you're going into deployments, into incredible difficult situations like Rwanda or Bosnia or Afghanistan, and uh, you're, you're facing all kinds of violence of both other people in uniform or civilians. Uh, so you learn to trust the people you're with implicitly, like you said, as they say in the 
in the armed forces, they have your six o'clock and you have their six o'clock and you learn to trust these people more than you've ever trusted anyone in your life. So when you, you, you come back to civilian life and you're, you're struggling with some sort of uh, issue, uh, it's very, very difficult to just pick up the phone and ask for help because you don't really know if you could trust that person. So uh, I spend quite a bit of time reminding veterans, I, I don't assume I'm going to get your trust. I'm going to have to earn your trust. But many veterans will only try and come in my door if they've had another veteran uh, specifically recommend me and say, I, I think you can go trust Brad. Why don't you at least talk to him? But But trust is a very important thing too, because there may be some embarrassment or guilt or shame that they, they can't tough it through or push through this by themselves. Um, and they're also quite concerned, can they actually trust me to hear some of the stories they have about things that they saw in places like Rwanda? Yes, that can be very difficult. Uh, they're, they're trained to be as self-sufficient as uh, possible in those hostile environments uh, while supporting their uh, their uh, comrades. But uh, it's it's awfully difficult when they come back and suddenly that structure is gone. Yeah, exactly. The people aren't there and you don't know what is available or what you're entitled to. And when you do ask or uh, when somebody else mentions, why don't you contact uh, this fellow or whatever? Yeah. Uh, and uh, nothing happens for months and months and months. Yeah. They give up and say, well, nobody cares. So yeah. uh, I guess I'm on my own. Yeah. Um, so Wayne, is, obviously, as you know, within a few weeks, we're, we're approaching Remembrance Day and Veterans Day. Is, uh, is there anything you would, you would like the public to know about Veterans Day or things, ways that the average civilian can support veterans as, as we approach Veterans Day? Because as you and I know, it's a, it's a tough day for many veterans. I mean, many veterans are, are rightfully very proud of Veterans Day and proud of their service and proud of other members' service, but uh, it can be a difficult time to remember. Not There's many, many um, veterans who have lost friends uh, to suicide. So is, is there anything you'd like the public to know as, as we approach Veterans Day? Well, yes. Veterans Day, Remembrance Day, is a very, very important uh, date in the calendar of the Legion. Mm -hmm. We exist, quite frankly, for the support of the veteran. Yeah. And this year is going to be particularly difficult because, unfortunately, we've had to cancel the observation of Remembrance Day that we usually hold at the exhibition grounds. Yes. Uh, and the reason, of course, is due to the uh, COVID ca uh, campaign that uh, mm -hmm. is out there. We, we can't risk getting large numbers of people in a confined area because uh, we know that that would represent a super spreader situation. Yeah. In, la in recent years, we've had a similar observance at the Sartap near the City Hall every year at uh, 12 o'clock. And that, too, draws hundreds of people in a close, confined area. Yeah. So it's as much, although it's outdoors, it's still a very risky situation for the spread of the COVID uh, virus. Yes. We, we are asking this year that people not attend these ceremonies, but rather observe them on TV or uh, through other media. Uh, the Legion will have a uh, very brief remembrance ceremony there. And we're hoping to have some of the older group of our veterans, World War II and Korea War vets. Uh, we'd like to have others present there as much as we can, but uh, in that this is the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, it's appropriate that we recognize and respect the service that that World War II veteran gave to our uh, country. Right. So we will have some there, and uh, but as I say, it's going to be a very brief ceremony, and I hope that people uh, are able to uh, observe it as much as they can on TV. It is important as a society that we continue to observe and remember the service of, of our uh, military and first responders, because in many respects, 
they are the ones that have uh, bought and paid for our freedoms and our uh, society as we know it today. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so yeah, I would like, uh, sorry, go ahead. Well, those are all uh, excellent points, Wayne. And uh, when I was thinking about preparing for this talk with you, um, I asked a number of my veterans um, what, what they would like uh, in terms of the points you and I raised and um, just how citizens can help support veterans. Uh, there, there was one request of things not to do. Um, the, the veterans I spoke to said they get a surprising number of people asking them, did, did they kill anyone or did they shoot anyone? Um, they're not sure why civilians ask this, but they they all said, could you could you please not ask that question? It's it's quite an insensitive question. Um, but what they all said was um, they you know they rarely get thanked for their service. They're thanked for what they did. So you know there there is the old expression, thank you for your service, and and they certainly do appreciate when people come up and thank them. But they, they also said just take a few extra minutes or just moments and just show interest in the veterans. So ask her, him, where they trained, what was their rank? Did they have any special skills? Was there anything they were particularly proud of? Um, so just show some interest in them. And they also really encourage civilians uh, to visit the museum out by the airport. It's an excellent museum out there. It would take half an hour to go through. And so um, they, they really, they love it when civilians just take an interest in what the Canadian Armed Forces have done. They, if you can't even go out to the museum, they said, please just Google the Canadian military and just spend a few minutes finding out where where in Afghanistan were the Canadian military, what were some of the famous uh, missions or battles that they were involved with, uh, where's Bosnia, where's Namibia, um, where's Rwanda. Uh, the, the, the Canadian military has been involved in a number of very, very important peacemaking, peacekeeping conflicts around the world. So just, they, they said, please just show an interest in what we do, learn a little bit about what, what they've done um, and just uh, acknowledge them and thank them and show a bit of interest in them. Uh, don't be afraid to yeah. go up and just, yeah. and they even suggested if you see a veteran with a veteran license plate, just wave, give the thumbs up, just acknowledge them. Um, if they're, if you have time, give them a Tim's card, something like that. Mm. Uh, but, but just, just to simply show interest in what they've done. Yeah. And I would add to that, Brad, uh, when you are, uh, in conversation with the veteran or members of your, your, uh, particular, uh, group, your friends, associates in, and you, uh, are aware of some of them who are veterans. Yeah. encourage them to reach out to the legion to yeah. con make contact so that uh, we can evaluate whether there's support and so on that they are entitled to and yeah. that uh, we can connect with them for that the, exactly yeah the the uh, remembrance day uh, ceremony at the cenotaph weather permitting uh, will be including a uh, bit of a fly past by a Harvard trainer. Now, uh -huh. This is a World War II aircraft. Uh, this particular one was produced after World War II, but nonetheless, the Harvard aircraft served as uh, an advanced trainer for uh -huh. World War II pilots. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the one that's flying uh, is one that I personally flew as a, as a student pilot, both in uh, Penhold and Moose Jaw. Wow, and, uh, so, uh, although I'm not flying it, <laughs> my, flying, my flying days are long gone, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it might be of interest uh, for the people of Lethbridge to take a look at that and, and realize that this is an aircraft that dates from those days. Yeah, wonderful. And when you hear that powerful Pratt & Whitney engine or whatever it is, just to uh, remember the importance of veterans and to mm -hmm. thank a veteran if you see them. Uh, yeah. Wayne, I know, I know we're almost out of time, but I also just wanted to emphasize, you and I have talked about some of the difficulties, but as you and I know, there, there's, there's, we see quite a few success stories too. I see veterans that get linked up with Veterans Affairs and are able to get compensation for an injury and able to make some things happen in their life that they couldn't. Um, I've seen veterans that are able to go back to school through Veterans Affairs and retrain. I've seen many veterans successfully get therapy and learn to cope with their PTSD symptoms to the point where it's it's in the background a bit, but it doesn't prevent them from 
having a very happy and fulfilling life. So I, I you know, I don't think you and I meant to give a a really dismal view of things, but because there are a number of success stories, but it is it is really important that we reach out to veterans and help the ones who are struggling. That's quite right. And help begins with that first step. Yeah. Well, so Annalise, I think we're close to our time here. Well, thank you both. Um, and we have quite a few questions in the queue. So I'll, I'll just jump right in. And the first question is from Timothy from the Lovebridge Herald. My brother started out in the army in 1994 and served in Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and recently returned from challenging tour in Iraq. Mm. Why psychologically do some fats struggle and others cope better? Uh, Wayne, can I try that one or? I think you can because when it, uh, or I prefer that you do, because when it comes to dealing with uh, psychological issues of that sort, I'm better prepared to comment about a broken limb than I am uh, <laughs> something that involves uh, the mind. Uh, okay. Well, if we get a broken limb question, we'll pass it on to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, thank you for the question. It's an important question. Uh, without trying to dodge the question, my understanding of reading the research literature is we we don't definitively know why some veterans uh, develop struggles psychologically or emotionally and others don't. Um, again, the, the best research is the majority of veterans do, do very well returning back to civilian life and uh, reintegrating uh, back into a, a different kind of life. Um, we, we know a few factors that seem to make it a bit more likely for veterans to develop some difficulties, but again, it's not for every veteran. Um, we know that extreme trauma or stress does affect the, the brain in a number of different ways. Um, there's there's a, sort of an interplay between our frontal cortex and our amygdala that triggers off our fight or flight system and then our hippocampus that tends to remember really vivid memories. Um, it seems like trauma throws us into a situation where those systems go into overdrive and the person has trouble settling them down because the body keeps trying to keep us alive um, by sending off almost all these false signals. It's almost like a smoke detector that keeps going off even if it's just toast burning. So it makes sense that if people have had previous traumas in their life, either accidents when they were younger or difficulties in the house that they grew up in, if there was violence or abuse or things like that, it, it doesn't necessarily predispose a person to have troubles later on if they go to Bosnia or Afghanistan, but it, it does kind of prime the brain for already having a bit of an exaggerated stress response. So the, the short answer is we, we don't quite know, but we do know that if a person's brain has experienced a lot of stress in their life, it may or may not make them more susceptible to, to having kind of an overblown reaction to stress, which is what we call PTSD, if they've served in the, uh, served in difficult traumatic events. So I, I hope that partially answers the question. Excellent. Um, Beth Mundell, my American, new, my American nephew returned from tours in Iraq with PTSD and has a horrific, horrific battle with disability support. Mm -hmm. Why? Are our why are our vets neglected? I think, well, again, there's there's a variety of reasons. Uh, she might be reacting to the the veteran support system that exists in the United States. Although the objectives are similar, the approach to veteran support in some cases differs greatly. Our system, uh, the biggest uh, difficulty I have with our system is the time required to deal with the bureaucracy. And understandably, over the, over the years, uh, literally there are millions of Canadians who have served in our, uh, our military, uh, some a matter of days, some for extended number of years. But there's an awful lot of them. And trying to focus on the needs of uh, an individual veteran within the context of that broad group is it can be very difficult and very time consuming plus the government uh, uh, right now as we can all appreciate 
uh, is perhaps more focused on things like COVID-19 and uh, other social issues rather than the veteran uh, 